chapter four of the private soldier under washington by charles knowles bolton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four firelock and powder although guns were far more generally used at the outbreak of the revolution than they are to-day a serious problem in each campaign was to provide firearms for the troops each farmer in seventeen seventy five had his trusted flintlock made usually by the hand of a village gunsmith with the disappearance of village artisans much of the charm and prosperity of rural towns has taken flight the little shop of the cordwainer or shoemaker no longer resounds to the merry tapping of the pegs or the creaking of the waxed threads in his hands the cooper and the broom-maker are so rare that few of the present generation have seen the one crowding his staves into place and the other shaping the broom-corn about the handle the itinerant weaver too has passed away and the miller no longer grinds the coarse flour corn-meal and buckwheat which delighted the children of a bygone age who of us looking through the advertising pages of a popular magazine will feel any sentiment for the factories and mills pictured there those unlovely successors of the vine-covered shops of the cordwainer the cooper the gunsmith to polish the barrel of a gun with buckskin and to keep a gloss on the stock by frequent use of oil and wax required more time than the average soldier could or perhaps would give so that during the war many of the firelocks soon wore out from exposure to the weather some were lost in difficult marches and others becoming broken could not easily be repaired since the parts were usually hand-made and a new part had to be fitted to its place the continental congress july eighteen seventeen seventy five in recommending the formation of militia companies suggested that each soldier have a good musket that would carry an ounce ball a bayonet steel ramrod worm priming wire and brush fitted thereto a cutting sword or tomahawk a cartridge box to contain twenty-three rounds of cartridges twelve flints and a knapsack the barrel was to be three and a half feet long in time congress established a continental gun factory at lancaster pennsylvania and a gun lock factory at trenton when the militia soldier provided his own firelock his contribution to the cause was considerable for those days in massachusetts a gun and bayonet were estimated by the provincial congress to be worth two pounds in pennsylvania in seventeen seventy six a gun brought about the same amount in virginia in seventeen seventy eight a gun appears to have been worth from three pounds to five pounds and a rifle a pound or two more a drum was valued at half as much at this time five pounds would buy about fifteen cords of wood pay a laborer for two weeks work or purchase some fifty bushels of coal the flintlock or firelock as it was commonly called was an effective weapon when supplemented by earthworks at bunker hill after two splendid but ineffective advances against the americans in their hastily formed defences general howe saw that the bayonet was his last resource to silence their destructive fire at long island the british used the bayonet with deadly effect by receiving the fire of washington's men and charging before they could reload therein lay the weakness of the firelock for the manner of loading was clumsy and slow the end of the cartridge a paper case filled with ball and powder was bitten off and a little powder was sprinkled on the pan the remainder of the contents was then dropped into the muzzle of the barrel and held in by ramming down the cartridge case like a wad the powder in the flash pan ignited by sparks from the contact of a flint with the battery a piece of steel communicated through a hole with the charge in the barrel from this description it will be evident that the manual of exercise called for movements more intricate in loading and reloading than were required later when the percussion lock came into use until the introduction of baron steuben's plan in seventeen seventy nine the form of exercise in the regiments was influenced by the previous training of the colonels in english french or german methods the english systems in use in the colonies before the war naturally had the greatest vogue 
in seventeen fifty seven the militia bill was passed in england to provide thirty two thousand men for home defence so that the regular army could be employed abroad as the new levies were to exercise but one day a week a simple form of discipline was desirable and that devised for the county of norfolk became so successful for drilling militia that it was known widely as the norfolk discipline this plan was in favor in new england as early as seventeen sixty eight when an abstract was published at boston and timothy pickering's simplification of the norfolk was much used at the north early in the war colonel bland's treatise published first in seventeen twenty seven was more or less in use in the south a copy had been in washington's library for many years the massachusetts provincial congress however had in seventeen seventy four adopted the british army manual of seventeen sixty four known as the sixty fourth which at the time the new haven edition appeared was in general use in connecticut rhode island and massachusetts bay the words of command and motions for priming loading and firing a flintlock may be of interest in this age of rapid-fire machine-guns the explanations are not given in full as they are very detailed to obtain uniformity in company drill one poise your fire locks two motions one lock outward fire lock perpendicular two left hand just above the lock and of an equal height with the eyes two cock your fire locks two motions three present one motion one six inches to rear with right foot but end to shoulder four fire one motion five half cock your fire locks one motion six handle your cartridge one motion one slap your pouch seize cartridge bite the top well off seven prime one motion one shake the powder into the pan eight shut your pans two motions nine charge with cartridge two motions one put the cartridge into the muzzle shaking the powder into the barrel two hand on rammer ten draw your rammers two motions eleven ram down your cartridge one motion twelve return your rammers one motion thirteen shoulder your fire locks two motions one left hand under butt two right hand thrown down at side these actions were much the same in all the manuals although in the norfolk they were begun chiefly from the shoulder and not as here from the rest baron steuben made his words of command shorter and sharper in the manoeuvres greater divergence appears at this time there were two serious objections to the firelock the soldier required so long to load and fire it that a rapid advance of the enemy close upon the discharge found him with no weapon ready for defence so that he was apt to be overcome with panic and the two qualities of powder needed in the cartridge and the pan for effective firing were difficult to obtain franklin advocated the introduction of pikes and in a letter in seventeen seventy six gave strong reasons for the use of bows and arrows claiming that a man could send four arrows for every bullet that his vision was not clouded by smoke that his enemy seeing the arrow he could not see a bullet had his attention diverted from his duty and when struck he was less able to fight it is interesting to hear colonel thompson a successful militia officer of south carolina advocate the next year for his regiment one hundred complete riflemen with good horses and spears the use of an old-time musket which now seems so cumbersome led to frequent accidents in august seventeen seventy five for example a man forgot to stop the end of his powder horn he flashed the powder in the pan of his gun so near to the horn that there was a conflagration which burned many soldiers another man lowered his gun to recock it when there was a report and the gun kicked him in the breast producing instant death the force of these firelocks may be illustrated by an accident that happened in december seventeen seventy five john mcmurray who was cleaning his gun put in the priming and pulled the trigger not knowing that it carried a load the shot went through a double partition of inch boards through one board of a berth through the breast of a man named penn 
and hit a chimney leaving its mark there the scarcity of firearms made it necessary in the autumn of seventeen seventy five for washington to order that no soldier was to carry away his arms if they were fit for use private property would be appraised and purchased in the following january he authorized colonels to buy guns which the militia were willing to sell and yet a month later two thousand men in camp lacked arms colonel rodzima's regiment in may possessed in all ninety-seven firelocks and seven bayonets in july of the critical summer of seventeen seventy six nearly one-fourth of the army had no arms and the new york convention ordered that each militia man without arms should bring with him a shovel spade pickaxe or a scythe straightened and made fast to a pole one method of obtaining weapons was to disarm all disaffected persons and another means of increasing the supply was to purchase through local committees of safety the arms owned by men who for one reason or another were not likely to engage in active service in pennsylvania county committees of safety by authority of the province assembly appointed three collectors for each township these men could call upon the nearest colonel of militia for aid or could bring before the committees any recalcitrants congress urged upon the colonies the need of encouraging gunsmiths and the colonies themselves imported large consignments of firearms from bordeaux in france Pléan, pinay et c of nantes did a large export business and claimed that they were able to send arms and powder directly from the royal manufactories lead was to be had with less effort that for the campaign of seventeen seventy six was taken from the statue of king george on the bowling green and from the housetops of new york and the amount needed for the operations of seventeen seventy seven came from leaden spouts and window weights of philadelphia as the bore of the muskets differed in size the bullet moulds were often of various sizes and were joined together so that a soldier could make balls to fit any firelock the running of balls running the lead into the moulds was a frequent duty in camp it was noted one day by david howe in his diary that he went to prospect hill after he had done his stent running ball a quarter of a pound of buckshot or a pound of lead to be cast into ball to suit the bore was a proper allowance for a man in stark's regiment each man on the day of bunker hill fight had a flint in his gun and was served a gill cup full of powder and fifteen balls for his cartridges powder was the crying need through much of the war as early as seventeen seventy four the provincial congress of massachusetts made an effort to provide powder in december connecticut sought to obtain more powder and mr shaw a new london ship owner offered a swift vessel to go to the west indies for this purpose to maintain a post within musket shot of the enemy for six months together said washington without powder and at the same time to disband one army i e of seventeen seventy five and recruit another within that distance of twenty odd british regiments is more probably than ever was attempted every effort was made to purchase powder to encourage the manufacture of it and to have the people save nitre and sulphur the provincial congress two months before the battle of lexington took place resolved to appoint a committee to draw up directions in an easy and familiar style for the manufacture of saltpetre these to be printed and sent to every town and district in the province at the public expense furthermore the congress agreed to purchase all the saltpetre manufactured in the province for the next twelve months at a stated price after the passage of this act a simple countryman it is said brought into the house half a bushel of saltpetre which he had made and promised that more could be made in eight months than the province had money to pay for his method the same as that described in the official watertown pamphlet is in the language of a contemporary letter to take the earth from under old houses barns and so forth and put it lightly into a hogshead or barrel and then fill it with water which immediately forms a lie this lie he then puts into an ashes leech that has all the goodness extracted before 
this being only as a strainer after it is run through which he boils the lye so clarified to a certain consistence and then puts it to cool when the saltpetre forms and is immediately fit for use and from every bushel of earth he produces three-quarters pound saltpetre on this information the act was suppressed for amendment the congress at philadelphia aided in the quest for powder by authorizing suspension of the non-importation agreement in the case of vessels bringing gunpowder or sulphur with four times as much saltpetre or brass field pieces or muskets with bayonets allowing them to carry out the same value generously estimated in produce from the colonies congress on june tenth seventeen seventy five recommended to the several towns and districts in the colonies that they collect all their saltpetre and sulphur to be sent from the northern colonies to new york from the central colonies to philadelphia and from those farther south to their committees and conventions to be manufactured into gunpowder the committee of safety in philadelphia not only published the description of a process for making saltpetre but called upon the local committees of each county to send two persons to learn the business at their works these men when trained were at the committee's expense to travel from town to town for the purpose of instructing others in the art the flint was characteristic of the gun of this period the blunderbuss a short gun with a large bore clumsy and inaccurate of aim had nearly passed out of use the old-time slow match which ignited the priming powder had given away to the grooved wheel with serrated edges rotating against a flint and this in turn passed out of use when the flint was fastened into the jaws of the cock and sprung against the steel hammer or cover plate of the flash pan each man when possible had at least two flints and also a wooden driver or snapper which was substituted for the flint at the time of exercise to prevent unnecessary wear of the stone a good flint would fire sixty rounds before it had to be repaired but the habit of snapping the lock was so prevalent that few flints did so much service flints were not easily obtained and workmen who could shape them were few when a vein of prodigious fine black flint stone was discovered upon mount independence near ticonderoga in seventeen seventy six the commanding officers of regiments were ordered to inquire if there were among their soldiers any old countrymen who understood the hammering of flints at the beginning of the war the farmers had their powder horns many of which bore designs and phrases expressing the sentiments of their owners it was soon discovered that paper cylinders filled with powder and balls and bound at either end with jack thread were more serviceable they were ready for use in an emergency and in time of rain or snow on the other hand they could not be withdrawn except by firing the gun and when powder was scarce the battalion or regimental guards quarter guards they were called were instructed it would seem to charge their pieces with powder and running or loose-fitting balls that there might be no waste of ammunition the number of rounds carried by each man was less than the british regulars had at almost every period of the war owing to the scarcity of cartridge paper and powder at the battle of bunker hill most of the men were said to have fired thirty rounds in the quebec expedition arnold's men had only five rounds apiece and during the winter of seventeen seventy five seventy six washington felt that he could not risk more than twelve or fifteen rounds at a time in the hands of the men later on the continental soldiers carried as many as twenty-five or forty rounds to be used against the sixty of the regulars given the firelock with powder and balls there was still to be considered the man behind it his skill and courage were worthy the attention of the commander himself in his book of orders under date of june twenty ninth seventeen seventy six washington said to his soldiers he the general recommends to them to load for their first fire with one musket ball and four or eight buckshot according to the size and strength of their pieces if the enemy is received with such a fire at not more than twenty or thirty yards distant he has no doubt of their being repulsed 
when placed behind earthworks or a stone wall this had proved the best of devices in the open field enough disciplined troops would survive such a fire to fall upon the raw recruits with fixed bayonets before they could in their inexperience load and deliver a second volley but the regulars were scarcely a match for the militia when protected by earthworks officers constantly advised the militia to hold their fire until the enemy approached to within a few yards of their defences they gave orders also to aim with care for they knew that many of the ranks were marksmen when five hundred volunteers were to be levied in the mountains of virginia in seventeen seventy five so many men came forward that the commanding officer made his selection by a trial of skill a board one foot square bearing a chalk outline of a nose was nailed to a tree at a distance of a hundred and fifty yards or about the space covered by fifteen to twenty houses in a modern city block those who came nearest the mark with a single bullet were to be enlisted the first forty or fifty men who shot cut the nose entirely out of the board at bunker hill the american works were silent until the british were within forty yards and where companies of grenadiers had stood three out of four even nine out of ten in some places lay dead or wounded in the long grass a scotchman living in virginia said two months later that the slaughter of june seventeenth was to be attributed to the fact that the americans took sight when they fired End of chapter four chapter five of the private soldier under washington by charles knowles bolton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five officer and private it is difficult to ascertain just what washington thought of the private soldiers when by a disgraceful retreat as once happened he was left in imminent danger of capture he was incensed at the cowardice of his men when he saw them enlist where they were offered the largest bounty he scorned their avarice but when they suffered and were patient were tested and proved loyal and courageous he loved and praised them he put his trust in the native rank and file and chose for his bodyguard only those born in america or those who were bound to the land by the strongest ties of blood the privates bore hardships such as in his opinion would have broken the spirit of foreign soldiers in the spring of seventeen seventy eight he wrote from valley forge to see men without clothes to cover their nakedness without blankets to lie on without shoes by which their marches might be traced by the blood from their feet and almost as often without provisions as with them marching through the frost and snow and at christmas taking up their winter quarters within a day's march of the enemy without a house or hut to cover them till they could be built and submitting to it without a murmur is a proof of patience and obedience which in my opinion can scarce be paralleled colonel john lawrence a young officer at headquarters shows in his letters a frank affection for the men whom he desired to command i would cherish he said those dear ragged continentals whose patience will be the admiration of future ages and i glory in bleeding with them from the words of washington and of lawrence it is reasonable to suppose that the rank and file were kindly remembered in the deliberations of those who formed the commander's official family washington knew the trials of the men who served under him his kindly heart tempered the course of justice because he could measure the strength of their temptations but officers were not always men of character or to use the old word men of true quality and the private reasonably patient under almost unheard of privation and suffering chafed beneath the yoke of militarism at the south the owner of a plantation having large opportunities for culture by means of his great wealth commanded respect and having many servants he grew to exercise the voice of authority at the north there was none of this and a distinction between officer and man did not prevail in the rural militia of new england this was due in part at least to the leveling influence of small farms 
the private's company officers were not infrequently his intimate friends or even his inferiors men who had devoted their time to the local militia organization and had become familiar with drill and tactics while he perhaps was busy with other matters the private could not understand why he should salute such neighbors because they were in camp or why he should ask of them permission to go beyond the lines when the men gathered at the siege of boston they were at first allowed much liberty a soldier wishing to go home for a few days wrote a letter to a friend or relative and asked him to come to camp as a substitute before many weeks had passed the men noticed the increasing rigor of army discipline even a man of superior education rev william emerson commented upon the great distinction made between officers and soldiers where every one was made to know his place and keep in it on pain of receiving thirty or forty lashes intelligent opinion was on the whole against the popular social philosophy of the day when applied to army life joseph reed writing to his wife october eleventh seventeen seventy six remarks where the principles of democracy so universally prevail where so great an equality and so thorough a levelling spirit predominates either no discipline can be established or he who attempts it must become odious and detestable a position which no one will choose you may form some notion of it when i tell you that yesterday morning a captain of horse who attends the general from connecticut was seen shaving one of his men on the parade near the house the same impression was gained by james wilkinson who noticed in the camp at boston but little distinction between colonel and private graydon is another witness he recalls the story of colonel putnam chief engineer of the army who was seen with a large piece of meat in his hand what said a friend carrying home your rations yourself colonel yes he replied and i do it to set the officers a good example and graydon adds that if putnam had seen any aristocratic tendencies in the army they must have been of very recent origin and due to southern contamination it was not at all uncommon for company or even regimental officers to give to their sons or younger brothers positions which were below commissioned rank but rank came to be more jealously guarded as time went on in seventeen seventy nine at a brigade court-martial captain dexter for behaviour unbecoming the character of an officer and a gentleman in frequently associating with the wagon-master of the brigade was sentenced to be discharged the service earlier in the war lieutenant whitney for infamous conduct in degrading himself by voluntarily doing the duty of an orderly sergeant was sentenced to be severely reprimanded among a rural people at the north the lieutenant's act of kindness could hardly have merited severity except as it injured discipline in other regiments in the south more was expected captain bernard elliott's diary has this entry the lieutenant-colonel cannot think the major could so far have overlooked the officer's command and authority as to order shepherd a private to take a power only due to an officer he assures the regiment that in future if an officer suffers his prerogative to be trampled upon which he ought to support he will be considered by him as a man wanting in that essential which constitutes the officer the practical results of the doctrine of equality when put in force were occasionally made evident by disorder and mutiny while the lack of a proper difference in pay for the officer and the private may have justified in the mind of the private this attitude of equality it could not have been the dominating influence among the troops from new england if it was among those from the middle and southern colonies washington calls it one great source of familiarity but the farmer of to-day is more jealous of his right of familiarity with the rich than with the poor and more watchful as his neighbor prospers to his reasoning a larger income brings no enlarged prerogative in social affairs where social distinctions were closely observed as in the south a marked difference in pay was more essential to the management of the rank and file but the difficulty existed and washington wrote to the president of congress september twenty fourth seventeen seventy six
while those men consider and treat him an officer as an equal and in the character of an officer regard him no more than a broomstick being mixed together as one common herd no order nor discipline can prevail what was the governing cause of this trouble many have answered the question in much the same words captain john chester of connecticut soon after the experience at bunker hill commented upon the fear of all officers from the captain-general to a corporal that the people would brook no exercise of authority and added the significant words the most of the companies of this province meaning massachusetts bay are commanded by a most despicable set of officers one explanation needs no proof to convince us of its truth where officers depended for their commissions upon their ability to raise companies or to persuade companies to serve under them the test was of popularity and not of military skill it proved impossible in massachusetts for many men to play the double role of recruiting officer and disciplinarian before the same body of soldiers with success several officers who would have made excellent privates or officials in civil employment were turned out of the army in disgrace before the war was fairly begun if discipline depends upon those in command what could be expected at bunker hill of a company whose captain ordered the men to march into battle promising to overtake them directly and never appearing until the next day i have said washington already broke one colonel and five captains for cowardice or for drawing more pay and provisions than they had men in their companies general lee and captain chester both speak of the absence of officers from bunker hill of lack of discipline and of readiness to retreat among many companies of privates who had not so much as a corporal to command them men who had had little or no discipline at home needed a strong hand in camp but a hand that they could respect as to the materials i mean the private men wrote charles lee they are admirable young stout healthy zealous and good-humoured and sober but to quote joseph hawley there is much more cause for fear that the officers will fail in a day of trial than the privates it was the officers who failed in their duty if failure there was at bunker hill they were the drill masters on the green but when the best stuff of the town was put under them and they were no longer merely drill masters but leaders they could not fill the measure they were not always gentlemen in so far as that term implies leadership in thought and action some were petty mercenary overbearing and themselves ill-trained to obey their official superiors these new england men said lee the professional soldier are so defective in materials for officers that it must require time to make a real good army out of them the same sentiment was voiced in almost the same words by another famous general of the war nathaniel green we want nothing he said but good officers to constitute as good an army as ever marched into the field our men are much better than the officers it would not be well to condemn many for the failings which were too evident in a few but the testimony of men like lee and green suggests that when the private fell short in discipline and obedience as frequently happened he was not alone at fault the charge was once made that the rank and file served for money while the liberties of america were preserved by the patriotism of officers in this connection a half serious remark of washington's reported by an officer at valley forge seems applicable so many resignations of officers said he that his excellency expressed fears of being left alone with the soldiers these resignations if we may believe colonel reed were sometimes prompted by cowardice i am sorry to say he writes in seventeen seventy six too many officers from all parts leave the army when danger approaches it is of the most ruinous consequences a failing among officers which was happily much less common than mediocrity or even cowardice was that of theft or embezzlement the soldiery were nearly helpless in the hands of those who withheld the pay of their men from month to month until mustered out of service or brought to book by a court-martial the new hampshire committee of safety to mention a single case voted august sixth seventeen seventy six 
that lieutenant gilman pay over to his men the coat money which he had the previous year received for them and had declined to deliver it would be unfair perhaps to assume that these malpractices were more evident in the revolutionary army than in any other army of volunteers and it should be said that the self-sacrifice and heroism shown by officers all over the colonies did much to put spirit into the rank and file an officer's ability to command carries with it a presumption that there is good discipline and obedience in the ranks john adams complained that soldiers loitered along the country roads and idled in the taverns in camp also from time to time there was a lack of discipline soldiers were known to be on friendly terms with the enemy and careless sentries allowed their guns to be stolen while they were on duty the practice of hiring one's duties done by another did not sweeten the lot of the poorer soldier although this could hardly have been of frequent occurrence refusing to do duty or threatening to leave the army were not uncommon breaches of discipline brought about often by the unreasonable conduct of officers timothy burnham corporal for keeping seymour on sentry from six o'clock in the evening until seven the next morning was reduced to the ranks moses pickett for disobedience of orders and damning his officer was sentenced to receive thirty lashes and afterward to be drummed out of the regiment the firing of guns in and about the camp was a constant annoyance that could not be stopped and during the siege of boston british soldiers hearing frequent reports followed by no casualties came to ridicule american marksmanship many of these acts of insubordination however are common to all armies in the winter of seventeen eighty eighty one the mutiny of the pennsylvania line consisting at that time of six regiments was one of the serious events of the war the men were in huts near morristown under the command of general wayne many of them had been engaged for the ambiguous term of three years or the war and now feared that they might be pressed to serve beyond the three-year period of their enlistment at a time when recruits were receiving large bounties for short service their own pay was already many months in arrears their food was poor and insufficient and their ragged clothes were filthy reports were current that officers had used the men cruelly but these carried little or no weight the first day of the new year was celebrated with an undue allowance of spirits and soon the men were ready to be stirred to rebellion by the picture of their sufferings artfully drawn by demagogues between nine and ten o'clock of the same evening the mutiny broke out under the lead of sergeant williams a deserter poor and fond of drink a number of officers were killed or injured in a futile attempt to restore order and the men with six pieces of artillery set off for princeton they marched with an astonishing regularity and discipline allowing general wayne and two of his officers to accompany them on the second day wayne asked for a conference with one man chosen by the soldiery from each regiment hoping as he said soon to return to camp with all his brother soldiers who took a little tour last evening but the rank and file would not listen to his proposals and the mutineers marched again on the fourth washington meantime apprised of events was using every effort to bring about an agreement he asked of the states a suit of clothes for each man and three months pay clinton of the british army was not idle he sent a message addressed to the person appointed by the pennsylvania line to lead them in their present struggle for their liberty and rights in which he offered to protect them pardon any of their number for past offences pay them what was due from congress and leave them free to give up military service if they wished these were generous terms offered by the mother country to her sons in rebellion as they recalled their privations and the uncertainty of their fate when they should again be in the power of congress they could hardly be expected to disappoint clinton yet as they put it they preferred not to turn arnold's the committee of congress and governor reed for the council of pennsylvania offered terms which the mutineers accepted the men who had enlisted indefinitely for three years or for the war 
were to be discharged unless they had voluntarily re-enlisted and where the original papers were not to be had the oath of the soldier was to be sufficient evidence certificates for the depreciation on their pay were to be given and arrearages were to be made up as soon as possible clothing a pair of shoes overalls and a shirt was to be furnished as indicated in the proposals finally no man was to be brought to trial or censured but the past was to be buried in oblivion when these negotiations were completed the british spies were given up and executed many of the men according to washington's letter to steuben dated february sixth seventeen eighty one took the oath before the proper papers could be procured and by perjury got out of the service the new jersey gazette in a discussion of the revolt remarks that the satisfactory conclusion will teach general clinton that though he could bribe such a mean toad-eater as arnold it is not in his power to bribe an american soldier the unfortunate affair was not without other lessons for men who could not be bribed needed the best efforts of the commissary department in their behalf the restless element wanted a firm hand also if the loyal majority was to remain obedient a few months later at yorktown twelve plotters stepped out before the regiments and persuaded the men to refuse to march because the promises made to them had not been kept wayne then addressed them earnestly and called upon a platoon of soldiers to fire either upon him who with his officers had been humiliated by the former disgrace or upon the instigators of this fresh mutiny at the word of command they presented and fired killing six of the twelve leading rioters one of the remaining six was badly maimed and wayne ordered a soldier to use his bayonet this the man refused to do claiming that the mutineer was his comrade the general instantly drew his pistol and would have shot the soldier had he refused longer to carry out the order general wayne then marched the regiments about the lifeless bodies and ordered the five remaining mutineers to be hanged in a recent work on the french army Declay's trooper thirty eight o nine there was evidence of much friction between company officers and men while something of the kind was suggested as the cause of the mutiny of the pennsylvania line this rumor never gained credence the want of clothing and food was too evident a source of discontent the following order of general john rutledge of south carolina in seventeen seventy six bears upon the relations between officers and their men and it has the right spirit it reads any officer that shall strike a soldier at any time hereafter whatsoever the provocation may be such act of striking shall be imputed as an act of cowardice save the major and adjutant do it and that tenderly and in the way of their particular duty End of chapter five chapter six of the private soldier under washington by charles knowles bolton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six camp duties the soldier's life was not passed in idleness uniforms and arms required daily attention before the hour for parade and the endless duties connected with cooking obtaining fuel and caring for the camp provided work for all day in camp began at sunrise with the beating of the reveille or earlier when some important movement was to be executed not infrequently the exact moment of dawn was unknown and the tired men were called from their beds in the dark day was said however to have begun when a sentry could see clearly a thousand yards around him and not before to farmers sons unaccustomed to shave frequently to put powder upon their hair or to brush their clothes a constant regard for personal appearance became at once oppressive during the period of late sunrise the men were instructed to shave in the evening that they might be ready for parade in the morning and their canteens were to be filled at night whenever there was reason to expect an early departure from camp or an attack in the opening years of the war many pickets from ignorance of military life or from carelessness brought trouble upon themselves some went back to their quarters to get provisions leaving their posts unprotected 
others sat down in comfort under trees and as just stated were so negligent that their guns were stolen from their keeping colonel crafts at one time threatened to punish those who persisted in relieving themselves from duty without the presence of a corporal in september seventeen seventy five the following description of military duty appears in a letter written by a southern rifleman at prospect hill on thursday at firing the morning gun we were ordered to ploughed hill where we lay all that day i took my paper and ink along as you once desired i would but found so much to do beside writing that you had only a few lines manufactured in the face of eighteen battering cannon and there was too much noise for writing and the generals appeared in sight i thought it not quite so decent a posture of a soldier thrust my writing materials under an old blanket shouldered my firelock and strutted with all the parade of a careful lad as the autumn of seventeen seventy five wore on the men became accustomed to the routine and were more alert although some failed to remember the proper password or countersign since it was changed every night a single sentinel demanded the countersign only but the sentry next to the guard upon hearing someone approach demanded who goes there and if many were in view he called to the sergeant of the guard who ordered out his men under arms when officers made the grand round the sergeant demanded the parole a watchword not known to the guard which he repeated to his captain if the parole was given correctly he cried grand round pass general ward's selection of the parole and countersign was intended to impress wisdom upon the lonely sentinel who was forced to remember the words if he was unwilling to accept their lesson the parole industry was given with the countersign wealth neatness with gentility inoculation with health in time of danger the parole look out with the countersign sharp must have suggested to the sentinel the path of duty at valley forge there was a chain of sentinels which surrounded the camp at the distance of a mile the men were relieved daily the following entry in sergeant wilde's journal while at warwick rhode island illustrates very well the performance of guard duty at sundown he writes i carried my men to roll call after the rolls were called i mounted guard with sixteen men under my command i marched with my men about two miles towards the point where i left my guard at eleven o'clock i sent a corporal and four men out as a patrolling party which went down to the point and all round the shore they discovered nothing remarkable came in again about one o'clock at which time i sent out another party which went the rounds as before and came in about three o'clock at which time i sent another party which went the rounds as usual and came in between four and five o'clock and then i sent another party which patrolled till daylight and then came in with the other corporal and four men from the point i went to the commissaries and got a gill of rum per man after i gave it to them i dismissed them guard service in all kinds of weather and sometimes in places of great danger was not the least trying part of the soldier's routine following as it often did days of great bodily exertion and fatigue he who fell asleep while on duty was punished by twenty lashes on the bare back or more if the enemy was near enough to make the crime a dangerous one the hardships which were endured called occasionally for a recommendation of clemency by a court-martial as for instance in the case of george cook who was tried in seventeen seventy seven for sleeping at his post cook had been ill of a fever for several days and unable to sleep the fresh air of his lonely vigil brought relief and he was found fast asleep standing at his place of duty when a sentinel deserted to the enemy he became the subject of comment old countrymen as the soldiers of foreign birth were called never quite gained the confidence of the army and if a man who was reported as gone over to the enemy was known to be an old countryman the fact was emphasized among the rank and file after the evening roll-call washington preferred natives for sentinels and later he chose from them his bodyguard he insisted that officers should place as sentinels at the outpost those whose characters were thoroughly known he therefore orders that for the future no man shall be appointed to those important stations who is not a native of this country or who has a wife or family in it to whom he is known to be attached 
washington was driven to prefer americans for officers also when the tide of adventurers from across the sea set in so strongly that it threatened to carry congress with it and drive the native officers into retirement lafayette however he continued to treat with an affection very like that of a father for his son honor and kindness while by no means unknown in war time were not as common in the revolution as the best military standards demand cases might be mentioned which did no credit to royalist or colonist about eight o'clock wrote john clunes in march seventeen seventy nine the rebels sent in a flag of truce to us the british but general powell would not see it and ordered us to fire on them which we did and out of five killed three british treatment of the enemy's outposts was sometimes cruel and uncalled for the following note by lieutenant eld of the coldstream guards describes an experience of his in new jersey i was sent forward with sixty light infantry to attack a rebel picket on the night of the main body of the rebels who were advantageously posted and fortified in a churchyard at a place called paramus the picket was placed at the edge of a wood with a plain of half a mile in the rear i surprised the picket which instantly fled and the most famous chase over the plain ensued we were in at the death of seven i had given orders that my party should not fire but use their bayonets after reading these words it may be well to recall an incident which is recorded in simcoe's journal for it shows that all the inhumanity was not confined to king george's men the rebels continually fired at night on the sentinels a figure was dressed up with a blanket coat and posted in the road by which the enemy would probably advance and fires resembling a picket were placed at the customary distance at midnight the rebels arrived and fired twenty or thirty shot at the effigy the next day an officer happening to come in with a flag of truce he was shown the figure and was made sensible of the inhumanity of firing at a sentinel when nothing farther was intended this was not an isolated case for david howe's diary under date of october twenty eighth seventeen seventy six states that riflemen fired at the sentries of the regulars while the british army lay in sight at or near white plains the danger which a sentry encountered came almost wholly from the sabre and the musket ball but a curious exception recorded by the rev benjamin boardman should be noticed here on monday night july thirty first seventeen seventy five the enemy opened fire upon the continentals from their works in roxbury and a cannon-ball came through the air so close to a sentinel that the man was set to whirling like a top he soon fell to the ground but was found to be only slightly injured a month earlier a soldier died from the wind of a ball as it was called camp life was not devoted wholly to drill or picket duty or cooking although idleness was discouraged cutting wood building fires repairing huts cleaning arms waiting upon officers tramping a road through the brush to facilitate the hauling of firewood serving in the grass guard to watch and protect the horses while feeding or making cartridges were useful services which kept the privates out of mischief the construction of earthworks building of whaleboats and other occupations incident to a campaign filled the men's time while in more active service in the expedition to crown point under arnold all hands were employed on occasion in necessary work men were divided into squads some to bake bread some to go in search of game or to spend their time in fishing others to cut timber or mount cannon in south carolina seines were provided for the continental troops that were detailed to fish temporary field works of earth were not in favor in europe a century and more ago they were held to be unmilitary and to foster cowardice but the defenses thrown up at bunker hill in a night proved effective in checking the british advance the firelock behind loose earth weighed heavily against disciplined bravery and the lesson once learned the continentals entered more and more into the construction of such works 
the lines were first marked on the ground in the angular forms so often shown in illustrated histories covering this period the gabions stakes interwoven with twisted bundles of switches like baskets without bottoms were then set on the lines three or four deep and earth dug up alongside was thrown in fascines bundles of switches about six feet long were then piled up on the outside and inside and were held in place by stakes four feet long driven down through them more fascines were laid on top of the gabions and the whole was then covered with earth and with sod in the space between the foot of the outer slope and the ditch or fosse which was a customary part of the works wooden pickets were frequently planted as was the case at bunker hill in october seventeen seventy five redoubts sometimes had as additional works half-moon structures or transes as at prospect hill farmers accustomed to handle the spade soon grew experienced in this form of labor expert artisans were called upon to make paper for bank notes print proclamations and provide many articles in constant demand these men were usually excused from all other duties and found it to their advantage to exhibit their ability when called upon the dearth of skilled artisans in america is well illustrated by the petition presented to congress in seventeen seventy six in which sundry paper-makers prayed that nathan sellers of colonel pascal's battalion might be ordered home to make and prepare moulds washers and utensils for carrying on the paper manufactory the gun-barrel maker the saltpeter maker and he of the nailer's business were in such demand that they could hardly be spared for military service forges had been set up all over the colonies giving employment to iron workers and gunsmiths the latter were not numerous and a few of these accepted the bait or bribe of high wages in england offered by leading royalists and left the country some of the soldiers were ordered to act as servants to their officers but as this kept many able-bodied men from active service and led to abuses it was discontinued by general orders at valley forge in seventeen seventy eight knowledge of music was also in demand in the boston campaign the drums and fifes of each regiment were regularly instructed by the regimental drum major and fife major and their music stirred the men as martial music does to-day when drums were not to be had french horns were used in the campaign of seventeen seventy nine against the six nations two men were cut down by the indians tomahawks later colonel proctor ordered his musicians in passing the spot to play the touching air of rosslyn castle the soft and moving notes of which cast a hush upon the regiment and awakened pity for their comrades the pioneers march was another tune used at the time the memory of one master of the drum should be kept green for he helped to while away many tedious hours during the northern campaign of seventeen seventy six tibbles was his name and as the boatmen sang at their oars they were upon the lake he would give one touch upon the drum which seemed to bring every voice into harmony the soldiers half covered with water as they lay in the boats forgot the loneliness and gloom of the darkening night the music lingered in each man's memory long after the voices and drums were still it is probable that yankee doodle had little or no vogue in the army and the statement by annuary that the lively air was a favorite of favorites the lover's spell the nurse's lullaby is open to serious question at funerals the impressive tune funeral thoughts with its drumbeat at the end of each line was sometimes played washington made use of the artisan in the army whenever it was possible but there were many occasions when capable hands were able to turn a penny after the soldier's day had closed early in the war barter and private labor prevailed among the thrifty to a surprising degree men worked at their trades during the hours between the retreat which beat at sunset and the tattoo which was sounded at eight or nine o'clock the makers of shoes leather breeches or caps earned money and by their work aided to some extent the efforts of the colonies to clothe the army david howe a private at the siege of boston bought and sold cider chestnuts arms and clothing 
a few lines from his diary will show the busy life that a soldier might lead when not on duty twenty five day january seventeen seventy six i bought seven bushels of chestnuts and gave four posterins per bushel thirty we have sold nuts and cider every day this week thirty one i bought four bushels of apples and gave twelve shillings per bushel for them twenty two february peter gage stayed here last night and i bought three pair of shoes of him at five and six per pair i bought a pair of stocking and gave five and four for them twenty three i sold a pair of shoes for six and eight twenty six i sold my cartridge box for four and six lawful money at the time he carried on this trading he was quartered in one of the buildings at harvard college and did his share of fatigue made cartridges ran ball and even served his turn as cook for the company a curious agreement made between a soldier and a landowner near camp stipulated that the former was to clear a certain tract of land fit for mowing and was to receive a hundred dollars paper currency but if headquarters moved before he had finished the work he was to receive payment for what he had done among the many duties incident to army life the observance of sunday as a day for religious teaching was not forgotten washington himself impressed upon the men under his command the value of christian character and his own example must have aided the chaplains in their difficult labors public prayers were a part of the daily or sunday routine followed by the reading of orders and usually the roll call washington's attitude toward religion in the army was unmistakably set forth when he said to the distinguished character of a patriot it should be our highest glory to add the more distinguished character of a christian and congress ready to promote the same ideals voted september eleventh seventeen seventy seven to import twenty thousand bibles it is curious to notice that all the members from new england were in favor of the measure and all those from the southern states except georgia were recorded as against it although lee of virginia and lawrence of south carolina were with the north a chaplain who it is said prayed and sang with the brigade has described the preparation made for services the music march up and the drummers lay their drums in a very neat style in two rows one above the other it always takes five and often the rows are very long occasionally they make a platform for me to stand upon and raise their drums a number of tears the sermon on sunday usually at eleven was often of a practical nature it referred to the hardships and the duties of a soldier it urged upon him temperance and vigilance cleanliness and honesty in many cases as in those cited herewith the minister altered the text to suit his need rev john gano who was attached to clinton's division of the expedition against the six nations in seventeen seventy nine was asked to preach to the troops at cannergery and was requested to dwell a little more on politics than he usually did he preached from the words of moses come go thou with us and we will do thee good for he that seeketh my life seeketh thy life but with us thou shalt be in safeguard rev mr kirtland preached september fifteenth seventeen seventy six to the new jersey troops at fort schuyler from the text he that is not with me is against me and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad upon the fourth of july mr gano took for his text these words this day shall be a memorial unto you throughout your generations but these suggestive sermons did not always attract the men and even when they were present discipline was not maintained as rigidly as would be the case to-day to increase the audience a penalty was once imposed for absence from worship a few hours spent in digging out stumps in a new york woodland proved effective it should be said in defense of the men that the preaching was not always worth a hearing mr bliss said a fellow clergyman preached at cambridge august twenty seventeen seventy five from those words in deuteronomy twenty three nine through fourteen and had he have digested his subject might have done well but attempting to extemporize it was as it was the critic himself however rather outdid mr bliss on the following sunday when as he records he preached the entire day 
but perhaps he had relays of listeners and not one weary throng as might be inferred rev mr gano was a serviceable preacher when he was informed that many of the soldiers before whom he was to preach on a certain sunday were six and nine months men whose departure from the army would be unfortunate he told his listeners that he could aver of the truth that our lord and saviour approved of all those who had engaged in his service for the whole warfare the rank and file were much amused and those who had engaged for the whole war forced many short-term men by their jesting to re-enlist but the laugh was not always on the minister's side during the winter at valley forge many parsons were at home as the men were too poorly clad to stand in the cold and listen to preaching mr gano was away on leave when he returned to camp he asked a soldier how his commander and the men had fared the soldier replied gravely that they had suffered all winter without hearing the word of god mr gano explained that it was their comfort he had had in mind true said the soldier but it would have been consoling to have had such a good man near us deeply touched mr gano told general van cortland of his encounter van cortland a little later asked to have the soldier pointed out to him and was surprised to see the worst reprobate in the regiment End of chapter 6chapter seven of the private soldier under washington by charles knowles bolton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven camp diversions rumors of victory or defeat lent a pleasant excitement to the lives of the rank and file a story of the patriot campaign in canada was passed on together with official dispatches from one post rider to another along the almost impassable river routes of maine over the stony roads of massachusetts and connecticut through the tory settlements of new york and so southward to the congress at philadelphia the dispatches reached their destination unchanged except for a coating of grime and wet but the verbal story grew with each retelling until the last post rider had news to astonish those about the campfires the official news was printed upon handbills which were given out to the men the effect of good tidings is shown in a somewhat famous scene when the stores from the captured ship nancy arrived in the camp near boston there were demonstrations of joy the scene as pictured by colonel moylan is somewhat startling old putt general putnam was mounted on the mortar with a bottle of rum in his hand standing parson to christen while godfather mifflin gave it the name of congress bands of prisoners of war and captive tories passing through the camp awakened patriotic enthusiasm which found expression in shouts from the men and the coming of well-known or curious visitors delegates from congress sent to inspect the army or indian chiefs and their followers helped to while away the hours the impression made by such events is illustrated in the record in a soldier's diary that the king of the ingans with five of his nobles to attend him come to headquarters to congratulate with his excellency for many years june fourth the king's birthday had been celebrated in america and when the day was allowed to pass in camp with no festivity and no mirth even the rebel in arms could not but notice this sorry end of a time-honored custom when september twenty second the king's coronation day was referred to as the king's damnation day war had indeed come the great day was the fourth of july commonly called the anniversary of our independency few diaries fail to mention with some detail the usual ceremonies of the occasion the whole army was drawn up under arms at one o'clock with detachments of artillery interspersed and thirteen pieces at the right the celebration began with a discharge of thirteen shots for the states followed by a running fire of musketry and cannon from right to left through the front ranks and then from left to right through the second line repeated three times a speech sometimes followed and then three cheers from the entire army games and an extra allowance of rum closed the day on the british prison ships where all the horrors of starvation suffocation and disease were rife the day brought a speech or a feeble cheer
another favorite anniversary was that of the day of burgoyne's surrender which was celebrated by the firing of cannon the throwing of sky rockets into the air skillocats in the air and much merrymaking when the welcome news was received that france had declared for the united states the delighted troops cheered for the king of france the friendly powers of europe and the thirteen states every continental soldier under arrest in washington's army was set at liberty to enjoy the day on more than one occasion a soldier under sentence of death profited by the news that the french king had shown his friendship for the colonies or that a distant battle had been won but the successes of the british bore hard upon the men in the patriot army and sometimes even those in captivity were made to know that their captors had won a victory major griffith williams in command of the detachment of royal artillery with burgoyne ordered that the american prisoners be drawn up in the rear of the british lines to hear the feu de joie given in honor of burgoyne's victories some it is said were stung by the insult while others threw up their caps with the british and were roughly handled by their more loyal comrades the customary holidays were not forgotten christmas and thanksgiving day brought greater liberties and an extra allowance of liquor even st patrick's day produced a noticeable change in camp the irishmen who had been born in america or had settled in the country before the war began were reinforced in some regiments by deserters from the british lines the widow izard a prominent lady in the south honored the name of st patrick in seventeen eighty two by a gift of a gill of spirits to each soldier in general green's army a little later the same army celebrated may day with maypoles and festivities although this was declared to be something extraordinary as indeed it must have been victories and anniversaries brought merriment and noise with their accompaniment of drinking and cursing congress occasionally showed an interest in these celebrations and sent the inevitable present of rum thirty hogsheads were consumed by the gallant survivors of the battle of the brandywine but there were other forms of amusement in camp the men played ball or cards and now and then were allowed a rifle frolic a contest in marksmanship in which the vanquished was bound to treat his more skilful adversary to liquor a form of relaxation not so clearly understood is mentioned by private samuel hawes as an old fudge fairy well my friends during the winter of seventeen seventy five seventy six which was bitterly cold at the north men enjoyed skating on the rivers and ponds and in summer they bathed whenever it was possible they sometimes were able to get away into the country to fish hunt and to gather nuts but these privileges were more often granted to officers nothing so depressed the spirits of the soldiers as the inactive life of a camp far removed from the enemy a spice of danger was always welcome to train the raw recruits to be fearless under fire a trifling reward was offered for bringing to headquarters each cannon-ball which was thrown from the enemy's batteries it was found however that the younger men failed to gauge properly the force and weight of a ball that ricocheted slowly along the uneven ground several soldiers in using their feet to bring a ball to a stop were knocked down or crippled this plan had to be given up when the shells from boston fell into the camp at roxbury shrieking like a flock of geese they did more said an observer to exhilarate the spirits of our people than two hundred gallons of our new england rum each shell as soon as it burst was surrounded by a throng of men eager for mementos funerals some one has said must be counted with amusements in a description of uneventful country life the chastisement of wrongdoers may likewise fall into line with the diversions of camp life without great impropriety for the curious modes of punishment in vogue at the time afforded some relaxation if they did not convey the obvious lesson the moral to be taken to heart by the onlookers was weakened by the frequent reprieve of the culprit and this misfortune was only too well understood by the officers one hundred lashes the limit of corporal punishment allowed made little impression upon the spirit of a sullen and wilful transgressor to give a hundred lashes their proper value and importance standing as they did for the penalty next to death itself 
many serious crimes that needed severe treatment had to be met with inadequate punishment the result as it worked out in practice was that the death penalty was too often imposed and this led to reprieves another unfortunate outcome of the system was the invention of new punishments more or less cruel or savage when officers became exasperated by desertions and mutiny a corporal and two privates were making their escape from the first pennsylvania regiment when they were overtaken and captured after they had been secured a dispute arose some of the captors wished to kill all three on the spot without trial and without authority others counseled delay it was agreed finally to kill one of the three deserters immediately the three luckless fellows drew lots and fate selected the corporal whose head was at once cut off and placed upon a pole this gruesome object was carried into camp by the surviving captives to be placed over the camp gallows as a warning to all if there can be any excuse for such savagery it is to be found in the jeopardy of a great cause by desertions from an already inadequate army washington once wrote our army is shamefully reduced by desertion and except the people in the country can be forced to give information when deserters return to their old neighborhoods we shall be obliged to detach one half of the army to bring back the other in the country about new york many of the inhabitants were from principle or interest trimmers in these uncertain times men when drafted were slow to respond to the call and many after enduring the hardships of camp life for a time returned home to aid a sick or impoverished household they had perhaps begged in vain for an honorable discharge telling as others did throughout the colonies of little ones without food or firewood and when they appeared in town again the neighbors beheld the deserters with tolerance or with half kindly eyes in a letter written at rhinebeck september sixteenth seventeen seventy six john white said i suppose there are not less in this and northeast precinct than thirty deserters who keep in the woods and are supported by their friends ebenezer wilde in his revolutionary journal refers frequently to punishments and it is evident that they interested him by their variety and terrible reality upon one occasion the culprits marched to the place of execution to the strains of the dead march each one with his coffin borne before him the brigade was then paraded with the guilty men in front where they could be seen after this their death sentences were read in a loud voice their graves were dug the coffins were laid beside them and each man was commanded to kneel beside his future resting-place in mother earth while the executioners received their orders to load take aim and at this critical moment a messenger appeared with a reprieve which was read aloud this last all-important act in the series was omitted often enough to strain the nerves of every one present by leaving the result in doubt until the last instant the whip was in some cases serviceable although it had little effect upon the hardened offender tied to a tree or post who ground his teeth into a piece of lead and received the stinging blows in silence when the prescribed number of stripes was administered in installments the flesh of the victim had time to become inflamed or to heal partially before the full penalty had been inflicted corporal punishment was carried out by the drummers and fifers under the eyes of the drum major who was required to be present seventy-eight lashes were considered proper for a deserter and thirty-nine for a thief a survival of the mosaic number but there was no invariable rule for writing an infamous letter against colonel brewer a soldier was sentenced to stand in the pillory for an hour where his comrades might witness his humiliation and suffering in less than an hour he fainted mr wilde our faithful chronicler describes another scene a soldier marching from the guard-house to the gallows with a halter about his neck and from there running the gauntlet naked through the brigade usually the brigade was drawn up in two lines to form a narrow lane sometimes half a mile in length through which the culprit had to pass to receive the lashing from switches held by the men if he was unpopular he fared ill if he was liked by his comrades and was fleet of foot 
he suffered but little to make the gauntlet a serious penalty a soldier was ordered to point his bayonet at the guilty man's breast and back slowly down between the lines so that the progress could not be too rapid for adequate punishment this ingenious device served to lay the victim on his bed for several days at ticonderoga a band of mutinous sailors ran a species of maritime gauntlet they were sentenced to receive seventy-eight lashes each the criminals to be whipped from vessel to vessel receiving a part of their punishment on board of each a more cruel punishment than most of those just mentioned was that of riding the wooden horse which so injured the man that some officers refused to make use of it but there were penalties that afforded real amusement as in the case of bowen sentenced to wear a clog chained at his leg three days or in that of griffith guilty of selling major carnes's cordage to wear a clog four days with his coat turned wrong side outwards End of chapter 7chapter eight of the private soldier under washington by charles knowles bolton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight hospitals and prison ships the scylla and charybdis of the soldier were the hospitals of his own army and the prison ships of the enemy perhaps the knowledge of this made the life in camp and on the road more endurable than it would otherwise have been to see the dawn over a hilltop drove out the depression that comes with the night and to stand in the full radiance of the warm sun at noonday baffled malaria and stayed the march of disease but the sun and the stars never came to the sufferer upon his sick-bed nor often to the half-crazed half-naked creature in his marine prison pen the health of the men in camp was not forgotten although the means of checking contagion and alleviating pain were inadequate and many of the household remedies of to-day were then still to be discovered in continued bad weather a half gill of rum was issued to each of the men and they were cautioned against drinking new cider and also the water of streams forded during the heat of the day the air of the huts and tents was purified by burning the powder of a blank musket cartridge daily or by lighting pitch or tar the hospitals were treated in the same manner in many of the hospitals where there were few beds or blankets and no medicine or nurses the service was not much more than the presence of a doctor until death came colonel wayne writing to general gates in december seventeen seventy six said our hospital or rather house of carnage beggars all description and shocks humanity to visit the cause is obvious no medicine or regimen on the ground suitable for the sick no beds or straw to lay on no covering to keep them warm other than their own thin wretched clothing at this time the death came so rapidly that the living grew weary of digging graves in the frozen earth a scene something diverting though of a tragic nature as lieutenant elmer puts it occurred in consequence two graves had been dug with much labor by men of the new jersey line for their dead but when they having gone for the bodies came back prepared to bury their comrades they found that some pennsylvanians had come upon the open graves and finding no one near deposited their own dead there and covered them with earth a hot dispute ensued and the new jersey troops succeeded in digging up the other bodies which were thrown under a heap of brush and stones good doctors and faithful ministers were rarely wanting in the camps and they went about where men lay tossing from side to side on sacks of straw or grass and did much to comfort the sufferers my heart is grieved wrote rev ami r robbins as i visit the poor soldiers such distress and miserable accommodations one very sick youth from massachusetts asked me to save him if possible said he was not fit to die i cannot die do sir pray for me will you not send for my mother if she were here to nurse me i could get well oh my mother how i wish i could see her she was opposed to my enlisting i am now very sorry do let her know i am sorry 
mr robbins was a devoted chaplain who had to nerve himself constantly to bear the foul air that injured his health and the tales of sorrow that burdened his heart he believed that the war was waged in a just cause and when the men of whole congregations went out to battle he felt that ministers should be ready to nurse their sick and bury their dead at saratoga an officer from each regiment was appointed weekly to visit every day the men from his own corps scattered through the hospitals but this care availed little when medicine and surgery were not always represented in camp by able physicians and antisepsis and anaesthetics were unknown cleanliness in conducting difficult operations was not insisted upon as it is to-day and the wounds made by large round bullets moulded by hand needed the very best of treatment putrefaction and pain ran riot in the emaciated bodies of the soldiers and many who survived never regained their health the kind of medicine recommended by a doctor's wife may prove of interest from a soldier's description of his sick friend's condition she thought the trouble might be gravels in the kidney as the diarist wrote the name and she ordered a quart of gin and a tea-dish of mustard seed and a handful of horseradish roots steep them together and take a glass of that every morning the gallant fellow submitted to this new affliction and happily was able to report that he found benefit by it the truth is that much of the illness came from a longing to be at home from hunger and from cold referring to the first of these causes of army sickness general schuyler once said of all the specifics ever invented there is none so efficacious as a discharge for as soon as their faces turn homeward nine out of ten are cured for the other tenth just referred to the remedy used at valley forge mutton and grog proved to be as useful as anything to aid in resisting the germs of disease that everywhere threatened the camp with pestilence in the quebec expedition when exposure and hunger had prepared the way a fourth or third of the men in some regiments died of smallpox from the records of the general hospital at sunbury pennsylvania for seventeen seventy seven to eighty it appears that about four tenths of the patients not counting the convalescents were the wounded about three tenths suffered from diarrhoea or dysentery and one tenth from rheumatism to state this in another form lack of proper food and shelter crippled the army as much as did the fire of the enemy the number of cases treated however was not large enough to give very accurate statistics the sick suffered from crowding and from an insufficient supply of medical stores those on the upper floors of hospitals had little or no ventilation and at bethlehem four or five invalids one by one occupied the unchanged straw until death came like an angel of mercy it is perhaps not very strange that communities did not want army hospitals and the arrival of open wagons in which lay groaning soldiers wet with rain and snow was the signal for vigorous protests from the populace as soon as the patients were able to walk they were told that there was too little food to make a longer stay desired and they were sent out penniless and weak to walk the country roads begging from house to house this in itself was an objection to the presence of a hospital in a neighborhood in such a state of poverty the support of a minister seemed an expense that could be avoided and few were found in the hospitals at new windsor west point barracks morristown albany philadelphia fishkill yellow springs williamsburg and trenton where many were often needed sickness and inadequate hospital facilities had a very direct effect upon the conduct of the war every haggard soldier who returned to the village of his birth was a silent force decreasing enlistments and increasing the amount of bounty to be wrung from the taxpayers this was particularly true at the south in the summer of seventeen seventy six seventy seven the commissariat was the great arbiter of events during the revolution insufficient food caused disease and desertion crippling the army until washington was forced to keep to a fabian policy that irritated those who were unfamiliar with the obstacles in his path 
if the continental soldier in the hospital of his countrymen had reason for discontent he might well believe that he would fare even less happily in the hands of the british who rarely were able to make adequate provision for their prisoners after the retreat from new york in seventeen seventy six the churches of the town were crowded with starving americans some with dull eyes and parched speechless lips sat upright and sucked bits of leather or wood the last act of a reason almost extinct and others lay upon the bodies of their comrades gnawing bones and begging their keepers to kill them while the helpless creatures were in this condition the sentries were said to have annoyed them needlessly the description of prison life in philadelphia during the british occupation is too ghastly to be credible in all its details dr albigence waldo of washington's army who has been quoted frequently in these pages complained that the enemy did not knock their prisoners in the head or burn them with torches or flay them alive or dismember them as savages do but they starved them slowly in a large and prosperous city one of these unhappy men driven to the last extreme of hunger is said to have gnawed his own fingers up to the first joint from the hand before he expired others ate the mortar and stone which they chipped from their prison walls while some were found with bits of wood and clay in their mouths which in their death agonies they had sucked to find nourishment one must keep in mind the fact that nearly all contemporary authorities were influenced by the bitter spirit of the times to overcolor their pictures of the suffering which came with war there were frequent complaints of cruel treatment of prisoners from the commanders of both armies british and american and each side hoped to profit by the publicity given to harrowing details at about the time americans were enduring privation in new york in the autumn of seventeen seventy six an event occurred at the north which proves that the british could show a magnanimity that might become dangerous to the cause of independence arnold's brave attempts to check the advance of sir guy carleton on lake champlain had ended in a furious naval fight and arnold's retreat the american sailors taken by carleton were treated like friends by the commander and his men news came to gates that they had been sent down the lake in boats to his camp and colonel trumbull was accordingly instructed to meet them trumbull soon found that the men were enthusiastic over their reception by carleton and loudly praised the generosity of the british in alarm he hastened back to tell gates that the men would work mischief with their tales of a bountiful enemy if allowed to mingle with the soldiers of the army trumbull's view was approved and the surviving captives were at once ordered southward to skanesborough on the way to their homes the prison ships were perhaps less oppressive in summer than the city places of confinement but at best they were unclean strictly guarded and insufficiently supplied with food and medicine many deaths occurred daily and on board the jersey popularly known as hell the morning salutation of the officer was rebels turn out your dead the horrors of those days have been pictured so often that it is unnecessary to re-sketch the sickening details the living and the dead lay together in the stifling holds of the ships until the time came to bury the latter these were put beneath the sand on the beach near by and in the next severe storm they were washed back into the sea to float for days in the hot sun near the portholes of the prison ships in warm weather one man was allowed on deck each night and the prisoners crowded about the grating at the hatchway to get a breath of air and to be ready when their turn came to go out the sentinels thrust their bayonets through the grating in sport and sometimes it is said killed one of their prisoners lest these scenes in the lives of the captive soldiers seem too incredible it may be well to add the experiences of a man of letters who was famous in his day and is not altogether forgotten in our time philip freneau the poet of the revolution freneau spent some time in the prison ship scorpion which lay in the north river in seventeen eighty the conditions there were so terrible according to the poet that any plan of escape however likely to fail was tried while every attempt increased the brutality of the hessian jailers who were held responsible for their detention when a number of men had rushed upon the sentries disarmed them boarded a vessel near by and escaped 
the guards in their chagrin vented their anger upon the remaining prisoners by firing into the hatchways freneau soon came down with a fever and was transferred to the hospital ship hunter some convalescents on board waited one day the coming of the doctor when he had gone below they slipped into his boat as it lay alongside and made a successful escape the doctor was annoyed and after that regardless of the sick and dying who had no part in the plan he passed by the hunter at a distance on his rounds an appeal for blisters too loud to be ignored one day caused him to rest on his oars he looked up at the eager faces suggested pleasantly that the sufferers plaster their backs with tar and rode on to the ill-famed jersey in a characteristic letter written in seventeen eighty from passy dr franklin told mr hartley a peace-loving englishman that congress had investigated these barbarities and had instructed him to prepare a school-book to be illustrated by thirty-five good engravings each one to picture a horrid fact that would impress the youthful posterity in america with the enormity of british malice and wickedness while patriot soldiers were suffering in city prisons and on the water many captives were beginning years of confinement in old mill prison near plymouth england and at fortin jail outside portsmouth usually they fared reasonably well although forty days in a black hole with half rations and no resting-place but the damp stones seems a severe penalty for attempting to escape or for commenting unfavourably on the quality of the meat isolated cases of barbarity were condemned in london newspapers and the frequent visits of mr hartley m p and rev thomas wren of portsmouth to american prisoners kept punishment within proper bounds the people of london in december seventeen seventy seven subscribed three thousand eight hundred and fifteen pounds seventeen shillings sixpence to provide clothing and other necessities a weekly allowance of two shillings from the american envoys was invaluable so long as it could be maintained but in seventeen seventy eight this was unavoidably reduced the fare occasioned comparatively little protest although franklin in his letters complains that those who were not sold into service under the african or east india companies were cheated by public prison contractors in seventeen eighty he provided sixpence per week for each of the four hundred or more americans and as his countrymen were not permitted an equal allowance with the french and spanish prisoners being rebels the money was very welcome in the following year english generals sent home great numbers of captives and franklin's efforts to effect an exchange were thwarted by the caprice of british officials many remained captive in england for as long a period as four years and when the general act for an exchange was passed in the winter of seventeen eighty two there were more than a thousand americans held for high treason in england and ireland the prisoners in some cases were allowed to make trinkets which they sold to visitors and they occasionally succeeded in sending letters to their friends the news which was allowed to filter in was usually bad news such as the final defeat of the continentals or the death of washington in considering the british treatment of american prisoners in america some allowances must be made the british army managed to cling to the sea coast of the continent but could not provide a suitable place in which to confine able-bodied captives who were ready at any time to effect an escape or to cooperate with an attempt made by the rebels to rescue them the length of the war also bore hard upon the british soldiers three thousand miles from home and increased an irritation which perhaps received its first impulse from the regulars natural contempt for the volunteer in rebellion against the king there were two ways of relief open to the prisoner in british hands one at the sacrifice of his honour another by the injury of his own cause he could enlist under the crown stifle his conscience and take his chance of capture as a deserter or he could if fortunate be exchanged for the red-coat in an american prison 
few of the better soldiers of native birth were willing thus to obtain freedom by service under the king and the exchange of privates for privates operated so strongly to the advantage of the british forces that conference after conference could find no mutually satisfactory basis of agreement and the prison ships kept their burden these prisoners who had all the claims of humanity upon their side were for the most part too enfeebled to be fit for further service and some were levies called into the field for short periods when exchanged therefore the sick would have to be discharged by washington and many of the able-bodied men having reached the end of their terms of enlistment would go home the british captives on the other hand were better nourished and less subject to disease as they were in the regular army they would remain in america or be sent to do garrison duty in the place of troops that were being trained for service in the colonies so it happened in this way that when congress was hard pressed to keep in the field a force not too conspicuously inferior to the enemy an exchange of prisoners was clearly a misfortune for every reason except that of humanity as an exchange was a most practical means of giving comfort to the enemy the privates who endured year after year the hardships of prison and prison ship instead of going free were serving their country as truly as if they had been in the field End of chapter eight